Another episode of The Art Bros brought to you by Fancy Dave, who's with me. Fancy hey. Zan. Yes. And uh, me, Mike. We are The Art Bros bringing you the latest in the, well, not the latest, but we're, we're making you smart. Yeah. The Art Bros. Hopefully. Way. Yeah. Hopefully. Don't use this as a source. I've got, people have told me that they're starting to using us as a source, and I don't think that's a good idea. No. <laughs> you're not going to get a doctorate with us, but you're at least going to get some cool art talk. So let's get this thing started. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, we are talking about a cool post painterly abstract artist known as Kenneth Noland, and we're looking at a series of, or at least selections, of his target paintings. Mm -hmm. Something that, he, that made him really famous and propelled him into stardom. Well, at least back in the 50s and 60s. So, uh, what are we looking at right now, Fancy? We're looking at, looking at beginning year 1958. And it's oil on canvas. Uh, is it? Oh, oh, it's not. It's magna on canvas. Magna. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know what magna is. We're going to look a, that up. <laughs> I think it's a type of acrylic paint they used to they introduced back then. Ah. Mm -hmm. I, it, has I guess some, it was has some there. different properties uh, compared to regular acrylic. It wasn't very popular because I don't think I've heard about it. No, Lichtenstein used it actually. Never mind then. All right, yeah. cool. Just got schooled by Fancy Dave live on Art Bros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this one's called Beginning. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about Nolan's paintings and a lot of uh, his contemporaries is that you don't need to know anything about the artist. You don't need to know what his backstory was, if he was an alcoholic, if he had daddy issues or anything like that. Because his painting falls into this school of thought that's called formalist. Yeah. And that just means art is just about art. It's not about life. It's not about anything. Or what even emotions or anything yeah. like that. Just there's no there's no message that's trying to be let out into the world. There's, it's not trying to change anything. It's just trying to push art. And this is what we have. Art is art representing of itself. It's a beautiful optical experience that we get mm -hmm. and a lot of, a lot if not all of nolan's work has to do with that theory although uh he does have an interesting history though what's um, that uh nolan okay what well what do we got about him well he was in world war ii he was mm -hmm. and but after yet th oh but what's interesting is uh he was a he was a student of both paul clean and joseph albers Right. Which would right. explain the uh, heavy use of color. And he studied at Black Mountain College, which mm -hmm. uh, which is a one of those – it's an experimental school, well, at least back in the 50s and 60s, that generated a lot of these artists that we know today. You know, back then, mm -hmm. Black Mountain College was just like a, a regular college that you went to maybe because, okay, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and apparently but, it was close to where he lived. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm sure he just maybe by chance he just went there. But it generated so so many of the artists that we know today um, that we, you and I study, Fancy Dave. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you, Black Mountain College. <laughs> Woo mm -hmm. And after that, he became friends with a, a fellow artist named Morris Lewis. I, and I do love Morris Lewis, and we're probably going to cover him on later episodes of The Art Bros. Um, but for now, we're focusing on Nolan here. Mm -hmm. And beginning, when I say that it is formulist, um, the only thing that doesn't really fall into the formulist theory is its name. Mm -hmm. Because we have beginning, and that's already making us think beyond the piece. It's making us think, the beginning of what? You know, Is he talking mm -hmm. about how circles, like a spiral, is, that, well, is the beginning of a spiral? There's something else that kind of sets it apart even more, though. Uh, the more I've been delving deep into this. Mm -hmm. Well, some people say he was kind of a, um, maybe the opposite of uh, someone like Pollock. Really? Yeah, because um, instead of focusing on brush strokes or anything like that, he actually used something very different to avoid brush strokes. He right. he would actually uh, like concentrate the pigment, uh, mm -hmm. distill it, so it's uh -huh. just pure color, and that way he would just stain the canvas rather than painting it. And he actually got that technique from Helen mm -hmm. Frankenthaler. I remember this. Um, he and he and his friend Morris Lewis, who we mentioned earlier, went to see Helen Frankenthaler in her studio, and she was showing them this technique that just eliminated the paintbrush completely mm -hmm. from painting. And he adopted it, and what we have is like these amazing targets things going on. Mm -hmm. um, should we move on to the next one? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what we're looking at now is Whirl. Whirl. 1960. 
1960. So, you know, he, he was on these uh, target things for a little while. Mm -hmm. We had the same general effect as now we have like this cool little whooshy, like kind sort of, of like I'm looking at a at a, a spin cycle. And the uh, staining itself is a little more blatant in this one around the edges. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it kind of like activates movement. Honestly, it really makes my my eye go all around. It really does. Mm -hmm. So that that's I like that I like that about this piece because although it's just there, my eye is just going crazy right now, mm -hmm. running all along the painting. I'm, I, I can't stop. Like you're whirling? <laughs> I'm getting dizzy. Whoa. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, like it's whirl, and um, I think it's very appropriately titled. Yeah. So, um, next one, or do uh, you want to say something about this guy? About this guy? Yeah. Um, the way I like it is because of the, uh, well, because it is stained onto the canvas. Uh, mm -hmm. The I, I guess the main focus here really is the color and the movement itself. Yeah, and it's a little interesting you chose these specific colors because they're almost they're almost disharmonious in a way. Yeah, they really are. Like the green is just so out of place, mm -hmm. but it's also so unifying. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, this goes this falls into the color field painting that you know he is known for as well. Him and other artists, mm -hmm. um, color field painting was a huge thing in the late fifties, and it was actually uh, it was sort of being said to be the next thing after abstract expressionism. Yeah. Although um, minimalism came and yeah, when knocked was, it out of the park. When I was looking into this, uh, it, well, the color field movement actually had a kind of a rivalry with pop art. Yeah. Although some people say, uh, I guess commercially, it lost pop art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just a little side note there. Yeah. <laughs> it did lose it. It did. It really did. And, uh, in terms of popularity, I guess, as well. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't realize is that movements like pop art and color field movement are happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's once you start thinking like that as an art as an art student, it really, it really kind of makes you realize, you know, the different rivalries that happened, how the art world worked back then as well. You know, so um, and a little vision of what it would become today. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why don't we move on to the next one? All right. So, we have Turnsoul, 1961, right? Yeah, and the thing I love about this the most is that we got, like, circles here. We got circles, but they're so well done. Mm -hmm. You'll never be able to tell that they were made by maybe a hand. I don't even think that the hand has a lot to do with this. Um, this has a harder edge to it. His, yeah, his technique is so – it looks so flawless that the only way you could tell it was done by hand is, I guess, looking at it close up. Mm-hmm. Because I'm looking at it right now on this computer screen, and I'm sure it doesn't do any justice to it. But another uh, thing I love about this is the subtle, extremely subtle, kind of just almost subliminal circles that are the second circle off right white. after a little dot. Yeah, the off-white. How your mind doesn't even pick them up until you really look at it. It really draws you in. As a viewer, you have to look at it in order to get the most out of this painting. Yeah, fancy. Yeah, I guess it's an optical thing as well. Um, yeah, it's because it messes with you on a couple levels here because they have this, fucking with me, bro. They have like this uh, <laughs> ochre almost kind of color, ochre yellow. Yeah, would you say that? And then the black, and then contrasting with that, and I guess that grayish dark blue in the middle. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So they almost seem seem to be competing with your eye. They really are. Every, mm -hmm. every all these stripes, even the subtle ones, are. They're all competing to get the most attention. And it's just another testament to color field and how good he was at it, along with Albers mm -hmm. and along with other guys that did color field, you know, especially Albers. You know what I want to do, though? What? I think we need to get some. Yeah, we we gotta get drunk. Make this a new dartboard. Like, Dude, I'm just, I've been shooting Nerf bullets at it the whole time. Like, <laughs> I'm just over here. Like, I'm trying to do it quietly because I don't want to interrupt the episode. <laughs> but uh, what are your final thoughts on kind of Nolan here? Cat um, Yeah, he speaks to me because of uh, my particular uh, leanings, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, yeah. I mean, this is. This was you could tell this was pretty experimental in its day, and that makes me love it more. It's very exp it's, ve it's very a lot of people considered it the safe route mm -hmm. because it doesn't do anything. You know, it doesn't tell you about the the politics of the fifties and sixties. It doesn't tell you about the lifestyle of the fifties and sixties. But for what it does for art itself, I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. As as 
you know, while the world was getting really crazy around the 50s and 60s from like this conformist, like a post World War II into like this radical 50s and 60s change, mm -hmm. I think the art world needed some sort of stabilization. And I think that's what that's what's great about artists like Nolan and stuff like that. They they kind of made you focus. Remember, guys, art is art. Even though art can be all these different things like pop art and minimalism and stuff like that, you got to remember that art can also just be art. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about this stuff. Okay, yeah. dude. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's me in my soapbox hour. So, uh, guys, thanks for listening to this episode. We'll bring you one, another one really soon. Mm -hmm. And um, if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe to us on YouTube. And, like us uh, on Facebook. Oh, yes, as well, right? Facebook. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we might... Oh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, okay. Yeah. We got we got other things up the sleeve mm -hmm. for you guys. All right? So, uh, so sit tight. And we'll see you next time here on Art Bros. All right. All right. Peace out. Later.